I, I'm going to introduce Dr. DeLeo. He's up here uh, on, in the middle panel here. Dr. DeLeo is a local neurologist. He and I have worked as colleagues for over 20 years together in the Santa Barbara area. So he's got a lot of, lot of roles here at Cottage Hospital. He's also in private practice. Uh, he sees pa all sorts of neurological patients and you're head of the uh, stroke services at Cottage Hospital as well. So he's a good one to have on speed dial. I know how I have him on my, my speed dial. So, um, and it's just been such a privilege to work with you, Dr. DeLeo, as a colleague and, and a friend for so many years. Thank you. But thanks for that. joining us. I only came here for the exercise part. I was, <laughs> they asked me to stay. I, I, before Dr. Tagliati comes up, I actually do want to make a couple comments. I'm going to steal the floor for a second and say that um, how genuinely appreciative I am of physicians like Dr. Keener and Dr. Tagliati um, practicing neurology in a, in a town like Santa Barbara where we don't have a big academic medical center, I would argue and say I know what I'm doing about half of the time, but don't tell, my patients are here, so I gotta be careful. Um, and we look to experts like the people on my left and right to help guide us with a very challenging disease and a very difficult problem. So the other half of the time I don't know what I'm doing, I look to them for advice. And then the other thing that I would emphasize to you guys, because you, you don't live in the academic world of medicine, is that having two individuals like Dr. Keener and Dr. Tagliati here is pretty remarkable when you consider that on any given day, I would hazard that their waiting room looks like this auditorium. <laughs> and yet they took time out of their Saturday to come here and talk to you guys about Parkinson's, which underscores it's personal to them. They genuinely care about patients. They genuinely care about making this disease better, and I think that just speaks volumes for both of them. Perfectly. Thank you guys for being here very much. That sounds very kind of you, but if my waiting room is so busy, it means I'm really late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna get started here with some of the questions. Now, th this is a very curious audience. Uh, I, there were tons of questions to go through, so I apologize if I didn't get to everybody's question. I consolidated them into different topics so that we could expand on some of the, some of the more common questions that people asked. So we're gonna start out on, um, first on early treatment. There was one question about does early treatment result in a better long-term outcome when you, when you get someone diagnosed early? I think this is up for grabs sure. for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. We can take turns maybe, yeah. I suppose. Uh, yeah, so I, I certainly think that uh, arriving at a correct and timely diagnosis is a really first key step. Um, we know, for example, that there uh, are delays in diagnosis and treatment uh, more often in women. Uh, and in underrepresented minority groups, and they uh, suffer comorbidity from the disease because of those delays in, in achieving the direct, correct diagnosis and, and getting treatment. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, if, if you have a concern or uh, are concerned about a loved one, I would encourage them to, you know, seek consultation um, because, yes, it is a, a first and critical step, and we know that those who experience delays in getting that early diagnosis and treatment do uh, suffer poorer outcomes. And just along those lines in terms so, of, oh, yeah, so if, go If I can add this. So that's a very, very interesting piece of information, the, uh, the fact that women, minority is unfortunately intuitive, unfortunately, but women I was not aware of, and it's an amazing piece of information. Uh, to, to answer, to, to further articulate the answer, um, I, I mentioned earlier during my presentation the, the fact of not delaying levodopa. There is no evidence that the treatment per se will slow down the progression of the disease. However, treating Parkinson properly and therefore uh, unlocking much of the mobility early in the disease allows uh, patients with Parkinson that are uh, only recently diagnosed and therefore can still, for example, exercise, 
do all those lifestyle adjustments that will result most likely in a uh, delay progression of the disease. So early treatment will improve the quality of life and as a consequence allow patients to do everything right. Even though the medication per se, levodopa or whatever else, is not, has not been associated to a slower progression of the disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. And along those lines too, life expectancy for patients with Parkinson's. I, I think that it underscores what my colleagues are saying here is I, I tell most of my patients that it's not the Parkinson's that's bad, it's the consequences of Parkinson's, it's falls, it's personal injury, these are the, it's pneumonia, it's aspiration, it's these types of things which become problematic and that underscores the need for earlier therapy. That, that's what we really focus on and try to emphasize is it's, it's those elements that are the most important. Does anybody want to guess what was the expected survival in a patient diagnosed with Parkinson's disease before we had levodopa? Anybody wants to guess? Three years? Okay, that's five, eight, eight years. So if you were diagnosed on today with Parkinson's disease, you had a life expectation of eight years. We know now that the life expectations has tremendously improved and it's not unusual to hear people having 30 plus, look at Michael J. Fox years with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. So. Um, I would like to say that the life expectation is not dramatically reduced. Obviously, the quality of life can be affected, but there is an expectation that uh, barring falls or, or accidents or surgeries or other issues, the life expectation is comparable to someone uh, of the same age without Parkinson's disease. I generally tell my patients, you're, this is going to sound harsh, but you will die with Parkinson's, not of Parkinson's, if you do everything exactly as I say. <laughs> I love that benign dictator. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there were a fair number of questions about causation of Parkinson's. So... Uh, one question had uh, one question was concerning COVID vaccinations. Is there any evidence that shows that COVID vaccinations have any sort of play in this disease state? No. I'm going to leave it at a, a no. COVID vaccination has a great effect on COVID. Uh, I don't know about patent. I don't think so. Um, Vaccination, I don't want to get into the old vaccination story, but vaccinations, like pretty much every other medical intervention, has side effects. Some people have reaction to vaccine. But Parkinson's disease, per se, uh, is not. Also, it would be too short of a time to even decide, because we started vaccinating people with COVID, what, two years ago, three years ago? So it wouldn't be enough time, because as we discussed earlier, we, we don't know the cause of Parkinson's disease, but even those environmental insults, and let's throw uh, the, the COVID vaccination just for sake of discussion into an environmental uh, insult, would take five to 10 years to eventually result into something like Parkinson's disease. So um, it, it's too early even to, to decide whether there, there, there might be an effect. And there were also questions about, I know we talked about pesticides and, and other agents in our environment. Uh, there were other questions about metal implants, chromium, cobalt, cobalt as well as other, other um, uh, chemotherapeutics that might be used, as well as an Agent Orange question. I, I said it's a hard one because I've had a number of patients who I felt that there was a military exposure that contributes, but it's always a difficult process because people who served in Vietnam and Korea are now in their 70s and 80s, and that's the age at which people start getting Parkinson's. So uh, similar to the vaccines, it's hard to prove cause and effect in those circumstances. We know that some of these agents are neurotoxins, 
but are they selectively neurotoxic for the dopamine producing neurons in the part of the brain that induce Parkinson's? I'm not sure we're clear on that, but I welcome thoughts from others here. Yeah, I'll just chime in since I spend part of my time at the VA. Um, uh, Parkinson's disease and recently brought into Parkinsonism uh, more generally is an agent or in service connected condition uh, within the VA system. Uh, the, you know, the, the basic science where they, you know, try to expo expose uh, like mice to Agent Orange and see if it results in Parkinson's doesn't draw a, a super direct uh, cause and effect link. Um, but I think when we think about uh, the summative exposures environmentally uh, and probably that component of genetic susceptibility, um, you know, the, the VA does consider Agent Orange as playing a role in the development of Parkinson's for those veterans who were exposed. So I would say um, if you are a veteran, uh, you should definitely explore your service connection if you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism as a secondary or atypical form of Parkinsonism as well, uh, because it will afford you, you know, additional resources and benefits through the VA. And, and there is a an elephant in the room of s especially uh, uh, serving in, in, in the battlefield, which is PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is associated with developing Parkinson's disease. It's considered a risk factor. So even without being uh, exposed to Agent Orange, I think that uh, the, the specific and undeniable stress of serving on the battlefield uh, might uh, be a precursor to Parkinson's disease. Um, the numbers are still controversial. There is not a lot of science, but definitely PTSD has been recognized as a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Along those lines too, is there any autoimmune, underlying autoimmune issues that could come into play with Parkinson's? I'll take, uh, take a crack at that. Um, so the, the, there are some associations between autoimmune disorders and Parkinson's disease, but not extremely clear. However, um, if you remember toward the end of my uh, presentation, I talked a little bit about uh, neuroinflammation and uh, uh, could uh, neuroinflammation be associated with some form of autoimmune uh, disorder? Absolutely, yes. Uh, autoimmune disorder like MS, which is one of the most uh, commonly known uh, that attack the, neuro the nervous system, is in the end an inflammatory uh, disorder. So um, currently we, we don't have much information and we don't consider uh, uh, autoimmune disorder as a specific cause of Parkinson. But I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, as I said, uh, one of the, the many Parkinson's disease that we deal with might be associated with autoimmune uh, disorders. Yeah, I think the, um, the other connection that you did actually allude to, too, in your talk, Dr. Tagliotti, was uh, inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Uh, whether that's uh, the direct effect of the autoimmune uh, state on neuroinflammation or, uh, you know, changing your gut and that gut-brain connection, um, sort of mediating that association. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly we... Or the LARC2, yeah. uh, which is a, a predisposing factor. The genetic uh, variant that predispose uh, some patients to Parkinson's disease also predispose other individual to Crohn's disease. And so that's another fascinating piece of the puzzle that we still have to uh, study better. All right, we had a question in regards to um, diagnosing uh, as a clinical diagnosis, but can you speak to testing in terms of DAT scanning? And, and uh, there was a question from someone that I had a negative DAT scan, but I was clinically diagnosed with Parkinson's. So, I mean, I think the por important thing to recognize, I do a lot of DAT scans. I, I'm not sure what you, how you guys feel about them. I personally find them helpful, but I think it's important for everyone to understand it's not the type of imaging technique that says whether you do or don't have the disease. It's not that kind of test. I wish we had a test I could do for patients and guess what I'm gonna do? I, I say this all the time to patients. Um, 
The brain and spinal cord is very unique in that we are really remiss in that we have no biomarker, right? So for every other organ system that you guys look at, we can pretty much test something and find out how healthy it is. If you come to my office and say, how's my liver function? I'll, I'll do a liver function test. How's my car- heart working? We have cardiac function tests. How's my pulmonary, my lungs working? We have measures of everything, kidney function. If you come to my office and say, how's my brain working? I'm going to shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> and, and DAT scans have been a very unique way at looking at sort of dopamine stores in the brain, and it's helpful, I think, at guiding a process. But I would never tell a patient, well, if it's negative, it means you don't have it. And similarly, if it's positive, it doesn't mean you do. It just is another uh, element of data which helps us come up with a diagnosis. But I certainly welcome my colleagues here to comment on the the utility of DAT scans for diagnosis. Uh, DAT scan can be very helpful, but it's a test. And uh, and in fact, I am sometimes um, mad to use a funny term, at my colleagues uh, in uh, nuclear medicine because they make the diagnosis in their report and Mm -hmm. that, um, in my opinion, is incorrect because all they can describe is whether there is a abnormality in the images but they don't know who is the person that took that test. And uh, the, the only one that can really put together the uh, observation and the test is the, the neurologist or the uh, movement disorder specialist. Uh, so definitely if someone um, has a normal DAS scan, I would pause on the diagnosis. Okay, wait a second, let's take a step back and re-examine the situation. Um, similarly, if someone has no evidence whatsoever of Parkinson's disease and comes with an abnormal DAS scan, I also would take a pause and, and, and review whether the DAS can maybe has some technical problems or maybe review the situation in six months. Maybe the DAS can, he is picking up some pre-diagnosis, uh, some preclinical diagnosis. But overall, in the vast majority of cases, the DAS can and the uh, clinical diagnosis go hand in hand. The DAS can can be very helpful in confirming the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think the only thing I would add is uh, to say that um, there are many medications that can influence the outcome of the DAT scan. Um, it's not a quantitative scan. It's, uh, it's somebody looking and saying, like, yes or no, sort of using their, their judgment. There's no, like, number or measurement that they use. Uh, and it doesn't distinguish between other primary forms of Parkinsonism. So if it's abnormal and your physician says, well, I still don't think you have Parkinson's disease, they might think you have something else uh, in which you can have an abnormal DAT scan. Um, so, so it's not specific just for Parkinson's. There are some medications that can influence how, you know, the outcome of the test. And so it's really important. I agree 100%. It's sort of one piece of additional data that we can use putting the whole clinical picture together to, to arrive at the diagnosis. All right, and great questions. Very, these are wonderful questions. Um, and the the next really big topic was about food. Given given your um, presentations about our diets, uh, and people want to know about more about dairy, eating yogurt, eating dairy. Is this a good thing, a bad thing for our microbiome? Could we elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So, um, so I will say that in, in you know, epidemiologic studies uh, looking at Parkinson's disease, people who consume a high amount of dairy have an increased risk for, for developing Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, Dr. Tagliotti also mentioned how it can impact your microbiome. Now, I'm uh, also a realist, and I think you should uh, enjoy eating things that, that you enjoy. Um, so I would say, you know, as with everything, uh, you know, in, in moderation and avoid, uh, I would say dairies that are highly processed and with a lot of other stuff in there, right? Like uh, a lot of simple sugars and, and other things. So that, that's my personal take on the, on the dairy story. 
with Parkinson's. Absolutely. And not, not only there is an increased risk, but also, as I show you, there is there are um, studies showing that um, a, a diet rich in, in, in dairy products seems to be associated with the faster progression of the disease. And the microbiome of patients with Parkinson's disease seems to be richer than normal, although the science is young, in lactobacilli, which are the, the bacteria that process uh, dairy product. So there are a lot of uh, clues that, that dairy may have a, a role in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, I stopped drinking milk. I only have oat milk and almond milk, disclosure. I have a problem with cheese. Um, but as I said before, uh, if we focus on the microbiome and, and if we believe, and, and I kind of do, that the influence of dairy or meat or, or, or other sort of bad food uh, um, is through the microbiome, um, if you stay away from milk product for a couple of weeks, you're going to change your microbiome. And then to have a little bit of that here and there uh, in very small quantity can please your palate without changing dramatically your microbiome. Now, it's a little bit like drinking or not drinking. You know, how much is, is a lot of drink? Oh, well, I'm going to get a glass today, a glass tomorrow, and you get back into bad habits. But again, it is not, even if you speak with experts like Lori Mishley, um, they, they don't tell you to go zero. Uh, of course, going zero for a while will help changing a certain uh, dietary habit, but it's never complete abstinence. Um, and so um, the moderation uh, story, but, but again, disclosure, I have not been touching milk in the last two years. But an Italian who doesn't eat cheese, I don't think that's I know, possible. I have serious problems I with mean, that, yes. <laughs> I, I, th I think it's like anything else. I, I, what I always find interesting is, um, is the way Western medicine has sort of failed to address dietary influence on people's health. It's been really unfortunate. If you knew sort of how little training we get in medical school about nutrition, you'd, you'd be horrified. It's not good. And I think the intimate relationship between what you eat and how you fuel your body and what your body ends up doing is neglected. And so I just look at it from a perspective as if I had Parkinson's, I would probably be doing anything that I'd heard of that could maybe minimize my disease. And if that involved drinking less milk, I would do it especially because nowadays we have so many good non-dairy alternatives. I, I understand when 30 years ago when people were bringing milk to people's doorstep or 40 or 50 years ago and that's all people drank, milk was everything. But we have so many nice alternatives now. I say, you can get by without milk. You can't get by without cheese. I don't believe that. <laughs> Although <laughs> but, <laughs> there is non-dairy yes. cheese yeah. and yeah. some of Cashew them is not based, bad. Yeah. Some of that is not bad. <laughs> But, but I think, as Dr. Taylor said, you make, you make small modifications, and it should never be a, well, I've sworn off everything forever. It's like, no, I'm just going to try to reduce it a little bit. I'm going to cut it out of my diet a little bit more, try to use alternatives when I can. And then when I want to have ice cream and, and yogurt and other things, I'll do that. But I just won't do it daily. Uh, it, and probably meat is actually more important than milk. Animal proteins, not just meat. It's chicken, it's pork. Fish may get a pass. Uh, but, but stay away from meat if you can. All right. Some, somebody wanted clarification about a moderate amount of caffeine per day, milligram dosing. <laughs> if anybody has any... Unless the Italian is going to take the fifth. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a do, do what I say, not what I do uh, sort of recommendation. Uh, uh, no, so I think, uh, I think in that specific study, uh, it was quantified as one or two cups a day was better than zero, um, uh, and also better than three or more cups a day of coffee or caffeinated tea was the way it was measured in that study specifically. It happens to be exactly how much coffee I get yeah, every day. Yeah, two it's cups amazing. a day, you bet. But, but it's a very interesting concept, actually, that Nothing is bad. We know that 
caffeine is actually uh, protective toward Parkinson disease. People that um, uh, drink more coffee tend to have a less propensity to develop Parkinson disease. But too much of it is bad. So zero and, and, and too much is bad. So one or two cups a day is actually good. The only problem is for those that may have a very tremor predominant Parkinson, the coffee can make the tremor worse. Uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that the Parkinson is getting worse, just is becoming more visible and in some time can be disabling because you cannot use your hands. But coffee is good. As well as smoking, but uh, we cannot promote smoking for obvious reasons. <laughs> I'm actually a big proponent of, of caffeine use. I think it's a very, um, a very powerful neurostimulant. Examples, we use it a lot in our stroke patients who say, I'm so fatigued after my stroke, I have no energy. I, I, I comment and say, Starbucks isn't what it is because everyone loves the taste of coffee. Right, because it doesn't taste that good. It, it's the stimulant effect people get when they drink it. it it's what promotes people drinking coffee. What, and what coffee are you drinking? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not a coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I have to say that. I say, but but uh, but I but I do find you know there's lots and lots of studies on this. Is if you give caffeine prior to students testing, prior to people doing academic work, they do better. They're they're more focused. You know, they have better energy, they, they, there's, there's elements to it. I'm not trying to say drink tons and tons of coffee, but there are elements that are beneficial for caffeine, I think, in limited quantities, one to two a day. And it's interesting, and this is a piece of information that I, I got studying the, the specifically. Coffee, which obviously is a stimulant, so if you drink a cup of coffee, your heart rate is gonna go up, the blood pressure is gonna go up, but over the long term, it's a little bit like exercise. Uh, when you exercise, obviously your heart rate goes up, you, your blood pressure goes up while you exercise, but then over the long term, at rest, your heart rate is going to be slower and your blood pressure is going to be lower. So coffee, similar to exercise over the long term, actually reduces that sympathetic tone and might be ex extremely beneficial. So again, everything in moderation, but coffee is good and it tastes well. <laughs> You can put oat milk in your coffee instead of regular milk. All right, thank you. Uh, there were a fair number of questions about clinical trials ongoing. And is there a Parkinson's disease vaccination that will, uh, that there's research for that? Um, uh, the answer is yes, actually. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, briefly, admittedly. I didn't go into too much detail, but uh, the, the idea of, um, of using antibodies against alpha-synuclein is a form of uh, passive immunization, but there are studies that also use active immunization against these abnormal uh, forms of alpha-synuclein, which are mostly tested in Europe. I'm not aware of a clinical trial in the United States about that they would be equivalent to what we do with vaccination and, and, and we sort of activate the immune system against this or that virus. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, topic of discussion and I would like to know your opinion because the only problem in my mind is it's based on the theory that alpha-synuclein is bad and I'm not completely sold on that. Definitely alpha-synuclein is, is something that we find in brains um, uh, affected by Parkinson's disease, but I'm not yet uh, sold on the uh, theory that alpha-synuclein is the cause of Parkinson's disease, because it might just be an innocent bystander or, or a, a product of the neurodegeneration. But that said, that doubt put on the side, the answer to the question is yes, there, there are studies that are trying to immunize the brain against alpha-synuclein and if the theory is correct against Parkinson's disease. All right, and uh, people would like to know how to become involved in any of the clinical trials. And there was actually a, a great suggestion that perhaps there could be a central clinical research center where um, patients could go and 
and all, all of the collaboration uh, through uh, Cedars and UCLA and Cottage and everybody could come together to, to really look at these clinical trials. Um, is there, how, how would you recommend that people take those first steps in getting into a clinical trial? Well, I'll tell you interestingly what's happening at a at a private level because it's it's easy for colleagues at Cedars and UCLA where research is happening all the time to have access to that. For those of us in communities like this, there's an interesting trend towards what's called the privatization of of research and academics. Example is I have a group that I work with in my office who ask to screen patients and then try to match them to clinical trials throughout the region because they realize that as a, as a private physician, I don't have access to all the clinical trials at all the academic centers on the coast of California, so they do that. The biggest limitation we're having with that type of process, as you can imagine, it's the confidentiality and the HIPAA requirements, right? Where everyone says we don't want to share our personal information and no one wants to know what anyone ha else has, so that makes things challenging to match people to trials, and it is, I think, a, a limitation. The NIH has a great website that, that lists all of the clinical trials that are ongoing. If you just type in Parkinson's, it'll show you all the trials that are happening and which ones are enrolling and where they are. And I think that's always a good start. <coughs> um, I'd ask my colleagues to offer opinions, but I would probably discourage you from just calling UCLA's Movement Disorders Center and saying, hey, can I be in a clinical trial? Because <laughs> I don't think they'll know quite what to do with you. But I think at least if you talk to your local physicians here, that's probably the best first inroad to getting in, enrolled in a trial. Yeah, I would say uh, that the Parkinson's community actually has a number of great resources. So clinicaltrials.gov is the website uh, that Dr. Lilio is referring to. Um, you can also sign up through the Michael J. Fox Foundation for what's called the Fox Trial Finder. It'll ask you some facts about, you know, when you were diagnosed, how old you are, you know, some basic demographic information, and then it will send you like an email, you know, like sort of newsletter about like here's some trials going on that you might qualify for based on what you filled out in your interest form. Um, there are other initiatives uh, like through the Parkinson's Foundation. Uh, there's one going on currently called PD Generation, where you can actually uh, submit a sample of your saliva from the comfort of your home to test for some of these common genetic variants of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and as Dr. Tagliotti mentioned, some of these are translating into clinical trials targeting these specific genetic uh, risk factors. Uh, and so the hope of assembling this, this database through the Parkinson's Foundation is that then they'll be able to reach back out to you and say, oh, hey, you have the LARC2 mutation, and there's these trials going on looking at interventions for people with that mutation, and so now we then have sort of primed to go this database of, of people who would qualify for those trials. So, um, and, and I will say, if you, if you call, uh, and I, well, I'll let Dr. Tagliati speak for Cedars, but if you do call our research number and say, I'm interested in getting involved in a clinical trial, then our research coordinators will collect information from you and let you know if there's a trial that, uh, that you might qualify for. Uh, and then the first step is you know, to engage in a, a screening visit. Well, they'll sort of check you out in more detail and determine if you do, in fact, qualify and explain the study to you. Uh, I always tell people that uh, you know, the goal of participating in a clinical trial is not for your personal benefit, for, but for the benefit uh, of others. You might get the placebo. You might be in a trial for one of these failed medications. Uh, so the goal of participating should really be altruistic uh, for all of us to learn and to, to make progress as a field. Uh, pretty much all said. So uh, clinicaltrial.gov is extremely comprehensive. It's the NIH database. But it can be a little bit uh, overwhelming to navigate sometimes. Um, uh, I think that the clinical trial finder, the, the Fox uh, clinical trial finder is uh, probably a more user friendly in a way because again they try to tailor to your particular condition. Um, if, if you call Cedar sinai as well as you call UCLA, um, we're always very, very interested in volunteers and, and, and participation. We don't always have a, a clinical trials that would fit your specific condition, 
but I would definitely support uh, Dr. Keener appeal for participation and 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 I understand and and I speak about this almost every day that sometimes it's hard to conceive spending three six months one year with the prospect of getting fresh water um, uh, injected in your veins meaning a placebo but um, but that's the only way we have to to truly um, learn whether something is working or not so if you can keep a, an, an, an open mind, uh, we, what we can promise, and I'm going to speak for, for my friends at UCLA, is incredible passion and incredible dedication. We, we truly do this for you. I mean, honestly, you don't make money doing clinical trials, honestly. Uh, I mean, they, they reimburse us. We, we actually um, support our clinical research coordinator, which are amazing people, uh, completely dedicated to research. But we really do it for the community, and uh, sure, we get maybe a name on the paper here and there, but it's, it's, it's something uh, that, that we try to do to, to improve the condition of Parkinson's disease. All right, thank you. A another question involved how to build your team of physicians, uh, how to build your team of therapists. How would you recommend one go about doing so? Well, I think uh, being here is a great place to start. Um, so I think getting involved with a patient advocacy group like the Parkinson's Association of Santa Barbara uh, will help introduce you to, you know, like who are the physical therapists here that have expertise in Parkinson's, you know, uh, you know, who's the, the, you know, the best speech therapist, you know, and so I think um, starting with, uh, with these patient groups can be a really powerful way. Um, I also think that, you know, building your team also includes, um, you know, your social support network. So identifying, you know, who's that person that's going to help your advocate take notes for you when you go to your doctor's appointments. Uh, you know, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your best friend, um, maybe it's your adult child. But, um, you know, starting, to, uh, it all doesn't have to fall on you to, to find all these people and find your team. So building your uh, your social network of people who are going to help you find these people uh, is going to be helpful. I think that's well said. I think I think that starting with your local medical team, they can hopefully be your point people, whether it be your primary care doctor or a neurologist or anyone else, and then they will usually help you establish with the other members of that team that you need. Yeah, you need a good quarterback, and. Um, that will help you coordinate the care depending on your needs. As I, I was discussing with someone earlier, you know, what, which, which are the, the, the specialists, it, it really depends. Some people might need a psychiatrist, some other a urologist, some other a urologist and a psychiatrist. But a good neurologist or a good primary care physician can help you uh, finding the resources in, in the community that, that can help uh, keeping all these motor and non-motor symptoms in, in, in line. All right. And my understanding, Dr. Tagliati, is that you recently wrote a book. Would you like to talk more about that? <laughs> I recently wrote the second edition of a book. Uh, which is Parkinson's disease for dummies. I had the pleasure of signing it for, for many of you. Thank you for the, the publicity. Is, uh, is of course, is a reference book. It's not a, a book for, for doctors. It's a book for uh, lay people, people with Parkinson's disease or their caregivers. It follows the, the well-known and renowned uh, formula of the dummies book. None, nobody in this uh, uh, room is a dummy. But um, I really enjoy working with Wiley and their uh, sort of guidance in, in making information sometimes you know, light and, and interesting and, and funny. We, we wrote the first edition in 2007, and after 15 years, I raised the, the question to the editor, so maybe it's the time to, to update the information. And they were very, very enthusiastic, and in a matter of a few months, uh, we put together our minds and we were able to bring together a second edition, 
which I find, uh, I'm, but I'm biased, being the author, <laughs> much improved and informative. Um, and uh, the, the, the piece that I'm most uh, proud of is to bring the uh, lifestyle chapter before the medications chapter. So uh, we go through an initial phase uh, of the shock of being diagnosed, what is Parkinson, what is not. And before we talk about levodopa and other medication, we're like, wait a second, there is something more that you need to do before, which is eat well, sleep well, and exercise. And, and I uh, um, literally um, uh, asked the, the, the publisher to move that chapter that in 2007 was at the end of the medication treatment as the first uh, uh, level of, of action and so I, I really made my point they, they didn't they didn't uh, um, argue with me but definitely I, I, I believe in empowering and my patients in, 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 the, in their lifestyle because that's under your control the medication is to some degree under our control but the lifestyle nobody can prevent you from eating well from exercise, you know, from going to bed early. All right, thank you so much. Uh, any closing remarks that you would like to say before I hand it back over to Jane? I, I would just say it's re remarkable to see so many people here, um, which really speaks volumes about all of you guys as a community and supportive of one another and actually supportive of trying to, to establish how to navigate this difficult disease. I mean, you guys are, I think that the curiosity, the interest in it is, is phenomenal. I think that's what will serve everyone well in this room is just your, your inquisition as to how do I do better with this? How do I get through this? How do I live the best life I can with this? And I, I think you guys being here is testament to that. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.